All right, let's go ahead and get started. We have, uh, we have a really amazing session in store for everybody today. Uh, I'm David Brown. I'm the Dean of the School of Health Professions at the University of Texas Medical Branch, which is in Galveston, Texas. Those of you who don't know where Galveston, Texas is, it's about 60 miles southeast of Houston, Texas. And we're a little slip of an island out in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. And we're a, we're a big target for hurricanes. So you all come out and visit us, not during the hurricane season though. Uh, and I'm really happy uh, to be hosting this, uh, this interview with uh, Dr. Suk Lee Lu, um, entitled Building a Big Data Analysis Research Portfolio During a Global Pandemic. So I'm hoping all of you are joining this joining us because you're interested in hearing uh, Dr. Liu's story about how she was uh, able to develop the skills and the knowledge to, uh, to have a research portfolio that involved big data analysis. By way of introduction, uh, Dr. Liu uh, is a PhD and a registered licensed occupational therapist. She's an assistant professor since January of 2015 with joint appointments with the USC Divi University of Southern California Division of Biokinesiology and Physical Therapy, uh, the, the USC Keck School of Medicine, Department of Neurology, and the USC Viterbi School Department of Biomedical Engineering. So maybe later I'm gonna ask uh, Dr. Liu how she attends all those faculty meetings uh, without falling asleep uh, going to all those faculty meetings but maybe that's later, so we'll hang on for that. So I, I don't want to say too much about Dr. Liu's background because we're gonna really ask her to tell us her story. And I guess let's start out with that. If it's all right, Dr. Liu, I'd like to start out by just asking you to tell us about the journey you took. I happen to know that you graduated from Rice University just mm -hmm. up the road in Houston as an English and kinesiology major. And from that, from those humble beginnings, you have, uh, you're now currently at USC and you've especially developed this expertise. You decided somewhere along the way that you would develop this expertise and acquire the ability to, to study biomedical informatics data sets and do research analytics on those data sets. So I'd like, uh, if you can, just tell us your story uh, your, of your journey. So thank you. Sure, sure. And thanks for that great introduction. Um, yeah, so like you mentioned, I did my undergraduate at Rice University. I grew up in Texas. So I have a special place in my heart for Galveston, which was always a vacation destination for Texans. <laughs> um, and when I was at Rice, I... I can't say that I was thinking that far ahead in my career trajectory. So I decided I was initially pre-med and then I switched to kinesiology because I liked um, the more hands-on like kind of applied biomechanics a little bit better. Um, and I also double majored in English because I like to read books. And I thought it was neat that that could be part of my major. Um, and so, uh, around my senior year of college, I had to take a career test because I didn't know what I was supposed to do afterwards. I hadn't really, I had not really thought past college at that point. Um, and the career test actually suggested that I either uh, become a farmer or an occupational therapist. And so I, of course, knew what a farmer was. Um, I thought about it and I, I didn't know what an occupational therapist was. So I looked that up. Um, and, you know, I think I landed on USC's homepage for occupational therapy and their program. And it said something like, do you like to help people and solve problems? And um, do you like to be creative and like find unique solutions to help people do meaningful things? And I thought, yes, that sounds great. <laughs> so I took the GRE and I went to school for occupational therapy at USC. Um, and it was a great experience. I'd say my very first summer when I was in OT school, uh, we had intensive courses in uh, kinesiology and neuroscience. And that was actually my first exposure to neuroscience. And I thought it was fascinating that the brain can control so many aspects of our behavior um, and that there are so many things about uh, brain injury and brain damage that are really fascinating and that the brain can repair itself and change in, in response to experiences. 
Um, so at that point, I actually talked to some of my advisors um, in the OT program and I said, I think I might drop out of OT school and just go to grad school for neuroscience instead. And they said, you know, like, you, have you ever done research before? And I was like, no. <laughs> so I said, maybe you should stay in the OT program, um, but just work in a research lab and so that you can see if you like it. Um, and at that time, they had hired a new faculty, Lisa Azizade, who was a neuroscientist, but she was in the Division of Occupational Science and Occupational Therapy at USC. Um, so they assigned me to her lab as a research assistant, and it was a great experience for me. Um, that's really when I first started to get an idea of what um, she did a lot of cognitive neuroscience. Um, she did fMRI and neuroimaging. Um, and because she was relatively new, I got to do a lot of hands on things in terms of um, anything that I was willing to do, she let me do because she needed people to, um, you know, move things forward. So that's when I started to learn how to program a little bit. Um, I learned how to work with brain imaging data. Um, and by the time I graduated from the OT program, the master's in OT, um, I really found that I loved research. I liked the process of um, asking questions. I liked programming, not for programming itself, I would say, but more because it's like a way to solve a problem. Um, and it was like a useful tool to solve certain problems. Um, and so then I stayed on and I did my PhD also at USC. Um, and I did it in Dr. Aziz today's lab. And so my thesis was really around how do we understand other people's actions. Uh, it was more of like a cognitive neuroscience question looking at uh, the action observation networks in the brain. Um, and towards the end of it, so I think during that time I learned a lot of like useful research skills. Um, and skills related to brain imaging and things like that. But towards the end of it, I started to wonder like more from the clinical perspective, how can I integrate this knowledge of brain imaging with um, my clinical background where I actually wanna help people now with this, you know, like it was like a basic science inquiry versus a clinical inquiry. Um, and one of the students in the lab was also working actually with Dr. Winstein, who's on the call, I see. Um, and it was doing a project using neuroimaging in people who had had stroke and looking at the action observation networks in people with stroke to see if that could be a backdoor way to kind of stimulate uh, the damaged motor cortex. Um, and I thought that research was really interesting. And so after I finished my PhD, I did my postdoc at the NIH with Dr. Leonardo Cohen. Um, and so his lab did a, was kind of a place where I could learn um, not only how to do the brain imaging, but also how, how we can actually modulate or affect brain networks. Um, so we did that with non-invasive brain stimulation, uh, with brain computer interfaces, um, and, and different techniques like that. And so at that time, I was learning like more on the modulation side. Um, and then when I came back to USC for my faculty position, um, you know, I think that's probably the hardest transition that a person makes in their academic career, at least so far. Um, because you then take everything that you've learned from all of your mentors and try to carve out your own niche and try to um, figure out what it is that you're going to study independently. Um, and I think at that point, to me, the biggest looming question clinically was still like, uh, how, how can we use all of this different research to inform how we practice and make decisions about what types of treatments we give to patients? Um, because when we when we have somebody come in like to the hospital, for instance, we don't necessarily know what they're gonna respond best to. And they do have a critical time period after stroke um, in, in which we want to kind of optimize treatment for them. Um, and that was the question, that's a question that I think a lot of people in the field ask and have been taking different approaches to answer. Um, and in my mind, one of the best, most promising approaches was to do something uh, on a slightly larger scale, like with bigger data sets than we had been using. So rather than looking at 12 or 20 participants, trying to look at much larger data sets. Um, and that's kind of what brought me to this point. Um, I think I was lucky that at USC, uh, there was a professor, Paul Thompson, um, who I worked closely with and who was a mentor on my um, K01 award, who had started this whole international consortium for data sharing and big data. Um, and so I was able to learn from him a lot about consortium management and getting big data sets together. And um, along with a lot of other great mentorship that I had, I think I was able to put together the skills that I felt would be necessary to start to answer this question. So that's my long-winded answer about how I started and how I got here so far. <laughs> that, that's fascinating for me to hear because I was very much, am very much the lab researcher collecting 12 to 20 
uh, data points in a, over a three month period mm -hmm. and getting somewhat frustrated with, with the lack of, of ability to make conclusions. So mm -hmm. how, how did you recognize that big data analysis was a, a fruitful direction for you to go in? How did you know that that would be a good investment of your time and your training? Oh, that's a great question. I had no idea if it would be a good, a good investment or not. So I did a few other things too, to be honest. Okay. Um, I think I tried, you know, we, we also, I started a research line more on like the non-invasive brain stimulation side of things. Um, and another one on virtual reality um, and kind of brain computer interfaces with VR. So we tried a few of them because we I wasn't sure when I started out what was going to pan out and if any of these were going to be interesting to anyone. Um, so yeah, I didn't know, but I hoped. <laughs> I mean, I think similar to you, I, and I think there's definitely a great place for studies like perspective studies for uh, 12 to 20 subjects. And we still do those in my lab as well, um, just because you can tightly control the data that you're working with, you can control variables and covariates, um, and you can make more clear um, conclusions because you've designed the whole study yourself versus big data sets where you're just aggregating data that you've collected, but also other people have collected with different intentions in mind. So I, I wonder if you would be willing to share to us some of the barriers or challenges that you ran into because it wasn't all just smooth sailing, right? No, it was not. And it's, and it's been an ongoing process since um, I think 2016 is when I really started and submitted the grant for this and everything. Um, and I have to be, I, I mean, I think everybody always does, but it's true. Like I have to be so grateful for the mentorship that I've received along the way. Um, or from Dr. Winstein and also from um, Dr. Thompson and um, Steve Kramer and a bunch of other people, um, Pablo Selnik, that just kind of like guided how I was doing what I was doing and gave me a lot of advice. Um, I think, you know, when you start something new that hasn't necessarily been done before, uh, people are a little bit skeptical initially, and especially for what we do. So. Um, now I'm the chair of what we call the Enigma Stroke Recovery Working Group, which is an international um, kind of a consortium of over 100 researchers worldwide. Um, and we have research data from over 50 different research studies that are both high resolution brain imaging and behavioral data. Um, but it's taken years to get to this point because when we started, um, I think it was, it was just me asking people that were more senior and established in the field if they would be willing to share their data and if they thought this would be a good idea. Um, and so I think having the buy-in and support of a lot of senior members in the field was really important and critical for me being able to get started. Um, and then just having different data sets and starting small and trying to figure out how am I gonna put these data sets together? What do all the variables look like? Um, how are people even collecting their data? You know, that's a question that I think most of the time we just see research papers from each other, but we don't know in what format the data is stored in order to get the statistics that they reported um, or to get the figures that they ultimately made. So um, there were, there was a lot of kind of like trial and error and then like retrial and making up new methods um, to accommodate new types of data as it was coming in. So, so that actually, actually, what you just mentioned is a good segue to the, the main theme of this uh, mm -hmm. session, which is how do you uh, perform the, these types of analyses during a pandemic where you don't have the ability to collect data firsthand anymore? Mm -hmm. and now you have to rely on existing data sets out there. So what, what can you tell uh, our group here, our participants, about yeah. how to start, where to get the data in a global pandemic like this. <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, I will note that I started myself before the pandemic. So that, <laughs> that part I'm not as sure about, but I think if you're getting started for the first time, there are tons of open source data sets and resources, depending on um, whatever it is that you're interested in or looking for. So um, actually I'm gonna put in the chat a link. Let's see here. So we made some slides that have lots and lots of links actually to different data sets that you could download and places that you could find them. Right, so that's on our GitHub. 
Um, and you can just download this PDF and it should have links that will take you to all different types of data. So like, I, like Dave mentioned, I mostly work with brain imaging data. So I'm familiar with lots of different brain imaging repositories where people have openly shared um, brain imaging data, both fMRI and structural resting state and diffusion. Um, they've also shared EEG data. Um, there's also data sets like with ICPSR, who I think partners quite closely um, with UTMB um, to have all sorts of different types of data archives. So like after people finish their studies, a lot of times they will archive the data set from their research study, whether it's behavioral data, kinematic data, video transcriptions or video data of, of behavior um, and just openly share that as well. So the slides that I posted have a lot of those links that you can um, go to and look for different resources. But in my mind, the best place to start is to download a data set of interest to you um, and just get your hands wet. So like download it and ask a research question um, and see if you can answer that question with the data that you have. Um, alternatively, you can partner with somebody who has a data set. Um, this is kind of like the lowest hanging fruit because if you have a collaborator or there's somebody else um, in a neighboring lab maybe that has a data set that they're done working with, they've already published on, and you have a secondary question that you feel like you could ask, you could ask them to share the data. Usually they become a collaborator and a co-author on the work, um, but you can also ask them questions, which is the best part is <laughs> like if you can actually dynamically ask them questions about their data um, and that way you can work with somebody else's data set, but still have access to uh, the ability to fully understand what was collected and why. That's a really good point that you make. There's no shame in secondary data analysis. Mm -hmm. And sometimes some of the greatest discoveries are made by, uh, by digging around in data that's already been published mm -hmm. in a primary format around a central mm -hmm. hypothesis. And then there are some uh, anomalous data that sort of stick out as really interesting. And, and then you go down that, that road and, and make new discoveries. So I'm glad you mm -hmm. mentioned that. Mm -hmm. Since you do mention um, asking research questions, can you say something about the nature? What types of research questions can you ask with open source data? How is that different? from mm -hmm. say, a, a prospective study where you start with a theory and a hypothesis and all that yes. stuff, yeah. Oh, that's another great question. And it's an important distinction. So um, I would say with big data sets, especially like with our Enigma data in which we're like aggregating data from 50 different studies, our variables and our questions are really limited because not everybody collected the same covariates, for instance. Um, we're lucky if we can get age, sex, and time after stroke out of the data set. And sometimes they'll say like, we collected sex, but this data is like 12 years old and we don't know where it is anymore. Um, so you really are limited by kind of what data you have and what data you can work with when you are working with bigger data. Um, I will say a lot of the repositories that are publicly shared, like um, the ones that I list in the slides, a lot of those some of them were prospectively collected with the intention of sharing that data. So they are really rich data sets. So for brain imaging, for instance, there's um, some called the Human Connectome Project, where they specifically just like collected hundreds of subjects using the exact same protocols and have really rich behavioral data in addition to brain imaging data. And they had intended to share from the beginning. It was NIH funded to share. Um, so those are some really nice data sets to start out with. Um, but if you are aggregating or asking kind of secondary questions on data that maybe wasn't collected for those questions, then you are a little bit more limited in terms of what you can ask um, and how you can frame the questions. I think for us, one of the things we're trying to do is be able to at least replicate uh, findings from other studies. So that's also an advantage of bigger data sets is that let's say in a smaller study of 30 subjects, there was a really interesting finding about um, a certain brain region being related to a specific behavior. Um, we can then try to look for that same relationship in our larger data set. Um, and usually the fact that the data is multi-site, it's collected across you know, a wider eligibility pool. Um, if we can replicate it in our larger data set, then to me it suggests that the data, then that finding is more generalizable and more widely applicable. So um, I think that speaks a little bit more to scientific re replicability and reproducibility. Um, and that's one of the advantages of using a large data set as well. That's really interesting. And as you're talking, I'm thinking to myself, what 
what are the skills that you need to have in order to dive into these these large data sets because mm -hmm. it's not you're not doing uh, novas and regressions are you you're doing something you're still doing novas and regressions a lot of the time actually that? okay yeah good. but you just have to be a lot more confident in the data that you're working with so i think it, it's actually the manual steps where like you know if you had 10 subjects, you might manually look at each brain image really carefully and maybe segment the brain images that you're interested in. Or if you're doing kinematic data on or kinematic analysis on 10 subjects, you might do a lot of manual steps to that data. Um, but once that scales up to a thousand subjects, it will take you years to do those same manual steps. So being able to program a little bit, um, program in a way that allows you to manage the data and do quality control on the data um, those things become a lot more helpful and make the big data project feasible. Where do some techniques like uh, around AE, predictive analytics or, mm -hmm. or uh, NL, you know, natural language yeah. processing, where, where do those fit in? Yeah, um, so like if you're, for instance, if you're working with um, chart data and you want to use like natural language processing to like sort through. So if you only had 10 medical records that you're looking at, you can just have someone read it and codify it and, you know, like pull out the elements they need. But if you need to look at a thousand um, chart, like chart records, then you probably want to start using something more like natural language processing and AI to um, to kind of sort and curate the data for you. And then you still have to do some manual quality control afterwards to make sure that the data that was pulled out is actually correct, but it performs kind of like a brute force first step for you. Uh, thank you for explaining that. The, the other thing, another thing I find interesting about the journey you described is how important it was for you to be mentored by people outside of your field, mm -hmm. people in uh, the basic sciences or in engineering mm -hmm. in basic biology. Uh, can you say a little bit more about how important it is was for you to to reach out to to different disciplines and, and mm -hmm. different teachers? Yeah. Yes, definitely. I mean, I think um, in the end, most research, but especially like this aggregation of big data with like neural rehabilitation and um, trying to understand scientific questions requires all of those different perspectives. And I think meeting with each different mentor um, helped me to realize just how diverse the expertise is and how critical each piece of that is. So like um, when I meet with somebody who is a mentor in the in like the data science side, they can advise me more on the methods or on the new approaches or something like that. Um, but then those approaches are only as good as what this underlying scientific question was that we were trying to ask, or if there was, you know, I think, especially in data science, there's like a, there is the tempting opportunity to brute force some something interesting out of the data. You know, you can just say like, you know, we put this into some sort of like machine learning algorithm and we got out this result and you can report that, but how do you interpret that? And, and why did you do that analysis? You know, I think those are kind of the more basic science questions that require domain expertise um, and also require a lot more thoughtful scientific hypotheses. So um, to me, I think being able to do meaningful um, results with data science really requires uh, both sides coming together and not just saying like, oh, we, you know, we analyzed 30,000 brains and we found these brain regions um, were significant, but understanding like, well, why would they be significant? And what does that actually mean in the greater context? And does that change anything clinically? Um, I think those are kind of, that's like the wide spectrum of, of expertise that's required, so. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So I, I think mm -hmm. one thing that our uh, participants would really be interested in hearing mm -hmm. from you is what advice would you give mm -hmm. uh, the group here? And by the way, I, I wanna let everyone know that our, uh, we're, uh, Dr. Liu and I are going to converse for maybe a few more minutes and then we're gonna open it up to all of you to, to send questions in through the chat box. So start thinking about uh, questions that you wanna ask, have them lined up, I'll be monitoring that. And then, uh, and then we'll, engage, we'll engage you all in, in the conversation as well. So, so Dr. Liu, back to my question. Um, 
what advice do you have for individuals or departments if they want to build mm -hmm. a whole enterprise within their department mm -hmm. on building a successful big data analysis research portfolio? What, what advice do you have? Uh, yes. So I think, you know, there's two sides to that. So as an individual researcher, I think the first thing is just getting your hand wet with some data. Um, like I mentioned, especially one of the most eye-opening things to me was when I started getting data that wasn't my own. <laughs> so whether it's a repository or it's a collaborator's data set, starting to learn how to work with data that's not your own um, is really important because you realize all the assumptions that you make when you save your own data. Um, like for instance, you know, when I was saving my own data and doing my own projects, I would have folders called like final analysis then like final, final analysis, then like real final analysis this time. And then, you know, like in the end you have like 15 folders called final analysis and you're never even going back to my own data. I'm not always a hundred percent sure what I did there and which one I actually used for the paper. Um, so like developing good data management practices for your own research is important. Um, and I think a lot of that comes through like looking at other people's data and trying to understand like what the universal principles are about how to manage data. Um, we did actually do a whole workshop on some of that. So I can also share that in the chat later. Um, and we shared those slides too, but essentially like developing good data management so that you can go back and your data is what we call machine readable is really important. Um, so that means you know, it's like simple things, but there are things that if you don't do them upfront prospectively, they start to um, take a lot of time on the back end. So like not having spaces in, in your file names, having the same folder structure for all your subjects, et cetera. Um, so for the individuals, I think starting to learn those practices and also working with somebody else's data set so that you get an idea of how to work with diverse types of data. Um, I think I also recommend um, Python quite a bit for working with data sets. Um, there's a, a library within Python called Pandas, which lets you like manipulate a data set um, into what's called a data frame so that you can do analyses like large scale analyses on those data sets. So those are kind of some basic tools. And then at the division or department level, because um, we've also been having these types of conversations in my primary division, which is in occupational science and occupational therapy. Um, I think one of the most important things is understanding what types of variables and data you want to start recording and keeping as part of a repository um, and then actively managing that data as it comes in. So even in my own experience, you know, we would get data from three different studies. It would take like a considerable amount of time to try to harmonize that data and understand that, you know, even a variable as simple as time since stroke, which you would think this should be pretty straightforward. Well, some people collect that in terms of years. Some people are looking at months after stroke. Some people are looking at hours after stroke. So there's a lot of what we call metadata um, in terms of like what exactly you mean and, and having like precise definitions for everything that becomes important when you're trying to build your own repository. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'll, I'll ask you one more question, uh, but the chat box is not exactly lighting up right now. So, Please write, write questions in if, if you want to ask Dr. Liu questions. Otherwise, you're going to hear me ask a bunch more questions. And, if you're getting and I love answering questions. So <laughs> this is my favorite type just, of format. You hear that. So yeah. don't, don't feel shy. Just go right ahead <laughs> and ask. Um, so, so you are very interested in taking large data sets and using it to make clinical decisions or to someday mm -hmm. make uh, inform clinical decisions. How does that happen? How do you start out with large data sets uh, mm. to make clinical decisions about individual uh, clients? Mm. That's, that yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, I think it's actually a pretty iterative process. So you start out with the clinical question that you're trying to answer and that you feel a large data set would be useful for. Then you look for that large data set or you have to compile it or create it somehow. Um, and then you see what you've managed to put together in terms of the large data. And then you revisit your, your clinical question and see if you really can answer that question using this data set. Um, so, you know, like, I think this is kind of what we were talking about with the prospective studies versus these large data sets is you're probably not going to find something that's like super specific for the exact question that you want to answer, um, especially if it hasn't been answered before. Um, but you do like kind of iteratively go back and forth between like, what can I ask 
and with the data that I have? And what's the most interesting question that we can look at with this data set? Um, I think in terms of the individual predictions, that's something that takes quite a while. So um, at this point, for instance, we have, a, mm, I would say we probably have about like 1200 subjects of usable data in our data set. I would say we have probably 3000 subjects worth of data, but of usable data that we could feed into like a machine learning or predictive model. It's a little bit smaller. Um, and so in order to start to make individualized predictions, we need to have a large enough data set to train a model on um, and create an algorithm that predicts some sort of outcome. So for instance, using whole brain imaging to predict long-term outcomes or long-term functional ability. Um, and then you can start to enter in new subjects into that algorithm and get predictions out from that. But you do need like a large data set to develop the overall algorithm first. Oh. Very good, thank you. Uh, it looks like we are getting some, some questions in the chat here. Erica Fernandez asks, what type of courses did you take in data science? What programming language is your go-to language for data analysis? Yes, uh, it's a combination of Python and R. And I've talked to a lot of other data scientists, especially um, from the academic side. And I think this is true for most people. So mostly I'll use Python with the pandas package um, in order to kind of manipulate the data, scrub it, clean it up. So that means things like looking for outliers, looking for missing values, um, taking care of making sure that the data has meaningful values and that the like averages of all my data variables are reasonable and things like that. Um, then I export that as a data frame into R and use R for the statistical analyses. Um, and that's just because those are the two strengths of the two programs. Um, you can do everything in Python if you want to, but um, R has like specialized uh, functions for different statistics and things like that. Um, and R is very bulky to use for data scrubbing. So yes, that's one thing. Uh, one thing I find interesting about Erica's question yeah. is uh, the the idea that you have to take a course in something. Can you say something? Can you learn these languages and these techniques without taking a course? Can you yes. go on YouTube? Can you, you know, can you? Yes. Just yeah. Yes, that's a great point. I'm sorry, I missed that part of the question. No, I didn't take any courses. Um, you can, there's a lot of free resources out there. Um, Udemy also has like always like machine learning or like data science, intro to data science and things like that, that you can do online for free if you want. Um, but once you get to a certain level where you feel pretty comfortable with both Python and R um, in general, then you can actually, I, most, most of my time is just spent Googling, <laughs> Googling questions. Um, and the most common site I use is Stack Overflow. So it'll be like, how do I manipulate this data set? Or like, how do I like multiply two columns of data? Or how do I, you, you know, you just ask the specific questions you're trying to accomplish and find the answers that way. And I think that's the best type of learning because you really remember it after a while. Um, and there's, it's such a broad area and a broad field that I think you can take data science courses um, and we actually are trying to create a whole data science program for rehab um, researchers specifically who don't have this background. Um, but at present, what's out there is more general. So you might spend like a lot of hours learning about something that you may not actually end up using in your own research. So that's kind of the trade-off. One, on one hand, if you took a formalized course, you would get the formalized knowledge um, in a given framework. On the other hand, you might not need to use all of that in your actual research. So part of it's just getting your hands wet with the data. Great, and and you know, old people like myself, when we hear that that's the way people are learning today, it, it just boggles my mind. And we were having this conversation the other day about medical students who no longer go to any lectures. They they right. learn what material was presented, and then they go online and learn it from someone else. It's mm -hmm. really amazing. Okay, just blew yeah. my mind. Okay, yeah. uh, Carol Lee asks, Lay, uh, oh. Just what happened to it? Oh, now people are burning up my uh, chat box. Okay. <laughs> Tell the group about your crowdsourcing for lesion analysis. Sure, sure. 
Um, yeah, so like I said, a lot of the work that you have to do, and I think you asked me a question about like what skills do you need? I think in addition to the programming, you have to be really patient and willing to do a lot of grunt work <laughs> um, and to do a lot of like manual processing of the data. So um, I think most data scientists will say like the data analysis itself is like 5% of the work, but data scrubbing or getting your data to a point where you can put it into the analysis uh, is like 95% of the work. And that's pretty true. Um, in my experience as well. Um, so a lot of the processes that we do are manual on the data. So making sure that, for instance, when we um, segment the lesion, that the lesion is correct and the lesion mask is correct. And we use automated tools for that um, because there's so many lesions to look at, but we also still have to go back and look and make sure that whatever the algorithm produced is an accurate segmentation of the lesion tissue in the brain. Um, so one of the things that we did is create something uh, it's a web-based platform, not unlike Tinder. So t Tinder, for those who are unfamiliar, is a dating app where you can swipe right if you want to date someone and left if not. Uh, and it takes a very complex problem, which is like, do you want to date someone? Which is actually quite a loaded question. And it simplifies it into a single decision, like a binary decision of yes or no. Uh, so we used a similar concept, but built a web platform with my colleague Anisha Keshavan. Um, so it's what we call brainder lists, and it has pictures of lesion masks that were generated by algorithms that blink on and off on the brain. And you swipe right if you think it's correct and left if you think it's incorrect. Um, and so it takes a very complex problem, almost as complex as dating. But in this case, the question is like, is this lesion math correct or not? And it, you swipe right or left. And then we get on the back end aggregated scores to that say like, you know, this subset of like 500 brains looks like most people would rate these as having incorrect lesion masks. This subset of 250 lesion masks are incorrect, so you should go back and manually fix those. So we crowdsource it and try to get lots of people to play it. And I'll, I'll put it in the chat here in case anyone is bored and wants to try it. You can just go to brainyourlist.us if you'd like to play. Um, you do have to sign a consent form and register, but then you can end up on a leaderboard. Um, you unlock levels as you uh, do more swipes. Um, and you also get to contribute to science. So uh, we really tried to roll this out before the pandemic when people were like waiting in line for things um, outside of their house or just bored. Um, but it's also, I think, a little bit relaxing to play even now when you're at home. It's just kind of mindlessly swipe right or left if you think the lesion mask is correct or not. But that's one way that we tried to crowdsource um, a very manual process that we felt could be taught to the general public and that other people could learn how to do. No, oh, absolutely. <laughs> thank you. And thank you, Carolee, for asking that question. <laughs> uh, Roshana Gangwani asks uh, for tips for grad student learning neuroimaging techniques and software mm. for her PhD dissertation. Mm, yes. Um, I think it depends on which neuroimaging analyses you want to learn, but in most cases, most softwares, uh, most of the standard softwares have really nice uh, open source data sets that they want you to kind of train and practice on. Um, and they'll walk you through a lot of those protocols. So for instance, FSL is one neuroimaging software that has really nice, they have slides online, they have tutorials online, they also have videos. And then they also have an accompanying data set that you can use to analyze and make sure that when you run the analysis, you get the same results that they have. Um, I think SPM is another one, but it depends a lot on what analysis uh, you want to do and which software you'd like to use for your dissertation. Uh, Ma Radalyn Burden uh, wants us to know that Coursera has free and great courses. So a little advertisement there for Coursera. Coursera is also great, I agree. Uh, Steve Fisher mentions, I can see how these modern secondary data analysis approaches could be powerful for looking at reproducibility of published findings. Did you say you or your colleagues have had experience with funding for reproducibility studies? And have you all found that journals have some interest in studies that attempt to replicate findings? Well, that's a great question. I wish we did have funding specifically for reproducing studies. Um, it's a great idea though, and something that we could apply for. Um, we have not yet uh, like applied for funding specifically for reproducible, uh, for reproducing existing findings. 
um, for stroke, where what I work in now, the biggest thing is that we have to have those lesion masks in order to reproduce most of the imaging findings. So we've been working really hard on that. We, I think at this point, have generated about 600 lesion masks. Um, we archived openly a data set of 300. We're getting ready to archive the second data set of 300. So anybody can use these lesion masks as well. Um, but we need that before we can try to reproduce some of the key findings in the field. Um, in terms of the journals, do they have interest in studies? There are some, but I think that if journals made it a priority to like kind of re reward replication attempts, it would be great for the field. Um, I know the Organization of Human Brain Mapping has a replication award every year, which is like people try to replicate previous findings and submit their attempts. Um, and then they actually call it out and give those people a, an award for whoever does the best job with a replication study. Um, but it's not that common still, even though I think it's one of the most critical um, things that every field needs at this point. So, but that's a great idea. I'll make a note of that. <laughs> I'm curious, what is your sense about neuroimaging uh, data sets? If a person mm -hmm. were to reanalyze data, reproduce mm -hmm. the analysis, uh, an independent mm -hmm. researcher, do you think they'd come to the, the same observations, the same results, the same conclusion? Um, I think it depends quite a bit. So I think, you know, a lot of, and I, I should have also mentioned, this is a lot of my um, kind of focus on reproducibility and open science comes from my neuroimaging side of things, because the neuroimaging field has really been pushing this forward for a number of years now. Um, so it started with what they call brain hacks that I was a part of, um, which are hackathons for brain imaging, um, where you share data and you collaborate with other people. Um, you can look up brainhacks.org <laughs> if you're interested. They, they have them on an ongoing basis, but they're these like really friendly open communities of people trying to share methods um, and techniques for brain imaging. Um, and as part of that, they also started to emphasize open science and replicable science a lot more. Um, so there's a whole program called uh, ReproNIM, which stands for reproducible, I think it's like Center for Reproducible Neuroimaging. Um, and that's one that I've been working really closely with because they've developed a whole pipeline and series of resources and training materials to do reproducible neuroimaging analyses. So they use things like, in addition to Python and R, um, also GitHub for version control, um, Docker for like software, um, kind of like packaging and management. Um, and they have this whole pipeline to go from collecting your neuroimaging data analyzing it in a way where all the steps are recorded and then sharing your data analysis and final results in a way that anybody could replicate. Um, it's what you call a, ultimately a reproducible paper because every step of that paper from the data acquisition to the data analysis and the results um, has been openly shared and the code for each of those steps has been shared as well. Um, so I think that that's a perspective that I would love to see applied to rehabilitation research as well. I think it's coming, but it's a little bit slower because, um, you know, I think in the neuroimaging side, everything is programming based. In the rehab side, not everything has to be programming based. And so that makes it a little bit harder to share code and methods and all of that. Um, but I think we're moving in that direction. So. Great. Yeah. Um, we have a question from MJ Lee who asks, mm -hmm or says, I am assuming that you're actively working with computer programmers in your research mm -hmm. studies. Could you please share your experience and or tips to communicate mm -hmm. effectively with people from computer, computer engineering and recruit them for your clinical research studies? And, and before you answer, be very careful because we don't wanna say anything disparaging about computer scientists and their, and their difficulty in communicating with <laughs> Go right ahead. <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> um, yeah, I yes, I have students. I'd say my lab is very interdisciplinary. So we have students that are whose backgrounds are in occupational therapy, and we have students whose backgrounds are in neuroscience and in engineering and in computer science. And yes, they all have very different personalities, I would say, but it depends not just on their domain expertise, but on their own personalities. Um, I think in terms of communicating effectively, uh, because we work in these interdisciplinary teams in the lab, 
everybody kind of learns what each other's expertise is and kind of like when to defer expertise to the other person um, or the a specific person on the team. Um, I think a lot of it is just, uh, well, especially for the programming side of things like um, kind of sketching out exactly what you want and what you're looking for. Um, I think, you know, it does help even if you don't want, plan to do the programming yourself to have some basic ideas of kind of like what the limitations are of programming, what the framework that the programmer is working with and um, is so that you have some idea of, of better communication. Um, but it is a lot of an iterative process where I'll say, can you, can you do this? You know, like, can you manipulate the data set in this way? Or like, can you give me um, like a result that looks like this? And then they'll try it and then they'll show me what they have and then we'll go back and forth to see kind of like uh, what I meant versus what they meant. So it, it's a lot of communication and an iterative process in those ways. And then I think in terms of recruiting, we actually have had great luck recruiting um, students from computer science. They've had a lot of great master's students in computer science um, come through the lab and make great contributions. Um, I think in my experience, actually a lot of our students um, have the computer science tools um, and they're really interested in, in applying them to useful projects and problems. Um, so it becomes a really nice marriage of the two because they know how to work with big data sets. They know how to do all sorts of like web-based tools or whatever, you know, whatever it is you're looking for, but they want something that's meaningful to apply those things for. Um, so it becomes a really nice partnership. Oh, great answer. You did that very nicely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good job. We have a, a question from either Kevin or Megan. Um, <laughs> Uh, let's see, I can't get the last name here, but uh, what does the registration process look like to avoid P hacking, et cetera? Mm. Does that mm. question make sense? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I can talk a little bit generally about P hacking. I'm not sure about the registration process or what they mean by that. To me, registration means a few different things. Um, it can be like registering the brain images to like a template space, but it's probably not what that is. There is also like registration of uh, like, like pre-registering what you plan to analyze. So that's something that journals will accept. Some journals have like a pre-registration uh, format where um, for instance, like you submit just your introduction, background, hypothesis and methods or planned methods and the journal will accept that, will review it with you actually and give you a lot of feedback. But if they accept it, they're saying that they will accept this paper no matter what your results are. So whether your results are like null or not null, they'll, they'll accept the paper because they approved the registration. So that way it's a little bit less, it has a little bit less of a pub, positive publication bias. Um, and that's actually an interesting approach, I think, in science. Um, in terms of the p-hacking, that registration, I think the pre-registration process for journals does help to avoid p-hacking because uh, for those who don't know, p-hacking is essentially when you run a lot of different analyses until you get a p of less than 0.05. <laughs> so, you know, you can analyze your data in a lot of different ways. You can throw out outliers if you want. You know, you can, if you're looking at the results every time you run an analysis, essentially, Theoretically, what you have to do is correct uh, for every analysis that you do on the data so that the P gets divided by the number of analyses that you've done. Um, and that's kind of the P hacking side of it is if you don't correct for that. Um, so the pre-registration can help quite a bit as well. Great, thank you. We have a, another question from Erica Fernandez who asks, how do you extract data from the electronic health records like Epic mm -hmm. software and just uh, uh, Dr. Liu and I were talking before this started, oh, that was kind of a new area for you as well, right, Dr. Mm -hmm. Liu? Yes. Yeah. yeah, so I actually have not extracted electronic health records data, and that's probably something that people at UTMB have more expertise with than I do. Uh, maybe some people on the call actually will, will be able to speak to that better than I can in terms of how to actually extract the data. Um, but once you do have the data, um, if it's written, if they're not in like specific fields and it's just like free text format, then that's where something like natural language processing would help to mine the text data, um, looking for specific patterns or specific variables of interest. So let's say you wanted 
um, like, I don't know, some measure of mood or cognition that you think isn't, rec um, isn't recorded in a field, but could have, the therapist could have written it down in the free text data sections, like in their clinical notes or something like that, um, then you could train a natural language um, processing algorithm to identify any keywords associated with mood or cognition or whatever it is that you're looking for, or sleep, for instance. Um, but I don't know how to actually get the data out of the health records myself. Good. Well, so maybe here's an opportunity. Who wants to jump in from the participants? And uh, does anyone have experience extracting data from electronic health records that they want to mention to us? Just unmute and speak. Going once, <laughs> going twice. Okay, okay. I'm sure you. There is someone out there. They just don't want to speak. So that's, that's fine. Yeah. There. Um, I will also mention there is the all all of us platform that's coming out. Um, if it hasn't already been released, let me see what it is. Something like all of us. It's an NIH funded effort to get data um, from a million or more Americans. And that will have health records data. And actually I was one of their like alpha testers for this platform. Um, so they already have a lot of health records data there. So if you wanted to get your hands wet with data without having to pull it yourself, you could try um, using the all of us data set first. And that's a lot of health records data. And there's also a concept called the learning health health system, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Which goes in with, with that idea of extracting records mm -hmm. and using the data to, to, to change the way the system works for particular patient populations. Yes. Am I right about that? Yeah. Yes, and that's actually an uh, NCMRR funded center. Mm, let me see if I can find it as well. It's like one of their key like big centers is to teach people about um, about learning health systems. And I think they may also offer some uh, webinars and resources if you want to learn more about um, you know, research in that area. Thank you. Mm -hmm. a, a lot of resources are being shared here. Thank you very much, Dr. Liu. And no thank, you, thank you very much for, for being so open in uh, discussing your work with everybody and sharing your experience. Uh, I, I, I think clearly uh, the pandemic has forced us all to think about how we can still be productive and answer important questions and, and move uh, rehab science forward. And mm -hmm. what you've offered, you've offered a very, uh, a very important way that, that we can do that. And it doesn't sound like the skills that you talk about are unobtainable, that you, know, you need some really advanced mathematics ability. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I think a lot of this has to do with engineers creating platforms that the rest of us can use. It used to be that you had to you had to do everything in machine language in order to program, and now it, it's it's very simple. So, okay. so thank you very much for sharing with us. And uh, if there's no other questions, I think we'll we'll end it here. This was really fascinating for me, and. Uh, and, and I really look forward to, to hearing about the new and exciting things that you're going to be doing in the future. So thank Thanks you very so much. And thank you so much for having me. I hope, yeah, some of the resources I shared are helpful. I actually just had a student graduate and defend her thesis yesterday using some of these um, openly available resources because she had to stop her data collection during COVID. So I think especially for students doing theses and projects like that, um, it's a great opportunity to kind of still develop your skill set um, without being able to collect data in person. So thank and, you for everyone's and the, time and attention. And, and by the way, I already asked, and <laughs> that, that PhD student has already chosen a postdoc. So uh, <laughs> keep your hands off of her <laughs> where she's going, because uh, I tried already. <laughs> okay.
Thank you very much, everybody. You have a good thank rest you. of the evening. Thank and thank you, you Dave, for the great questions.